Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you, GUI, for inviting me to talk about what we do at Subnero. So my name is Chinmay. I work for a company called Subnero. And I'll be sharing with you what we have been doing with the uh, underwater theme of things. Uh, the, the talks before me were very interesting. I think set a lot of stage for uh, the interesting challenges there underwater. Uh, you know, like one of the things that I always feel that because we live on land, we always don't think of the different things that change when we go underwater. And as we go, uh, as we go and explore things, as we listen to the different talks today, we re realize that you know, things are very, very different underwater. And, and we need to come up with a lot of interesting ideas, like what Vignesh was talking about, different kinds of robots, different kinds of sensing, um, to be able to do things that we want to do, uh, like exploration uh, underwater. So um, what we do is uh, wireless uh, internet underwater. Uh, and the question is, why? Why do you, wanna ca why do you care about uh, you know, wireless networking underwater? So, um, uh, well, t everybody talked about this. A large part of the, our world is actually uh, under the ocean. And uh, if you want to do things like uh, measure, monitor, sense, or you know, the robots we talked about, if you want them to talk to each other, uh, or if you were talking about uh, the coral reefs, if you want to go down and place some sensors there and you know, read, uh, try to find out what's going on, try to trace what's going on, uh, we need to bring this information back to you know, where we live and, and our internet and what we want to do to be able to see it and track it and monitor it and then based on that take actions or maybe send some robots uh, down uh, with it. And that basically needs internet connectivity. And uh, one of the biggest problems uh, is um, that cables, which is what we generally use for internet, um, when you sort of stretch that to the ocean size of things, uh, it gets a little unwieldy. This is a ship that's used to lay cables. Uh, these things are massive. Uh, laying cables is huge uh, effort. It's expensive. Uh, it, it disrupts a lot of the ocean, and it's a real problem to basically lay cables to somewhere deep inside at the bottom or somewhere far in the sea to you know to be able to get any kind of network or power or anything uh, remotely uh, useful uh, in these areas. Uh, this is a reel of cable uh, in one of these ships. Uh, these things are tons, like multitudes of tons, super clumsy. And one of the biggest problems is they break quite easily. Um, I mean, you saw about, you're talking about robots, and you're talking about uh, giant sea animals. Um, these things are con I mean, considerably clumsy with respect to what you know, the ocean can throw at it. So uh, breakage of cables is quite annoying. Um, then we think about it, it's like, wait, uh, we have wireless internet. Everybody has a phone in their pocket here, and you're still connected to you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. This works on land. Why doesn't it work in water? I mean, it's just so simple. So um, you know, we have not only does it work on land, antennas, uh, is, which is what we use uh, in the, in the you know, terrestrial Wi-Fi uh, or wireless internet, uh, works in satellites. And in fact, recently we had transmission from Jupiter, uh, which is thousands of miles or uh, thousands of kilometers away, uh, and you're still getting data from that. So it works very easily in air. So wait, why does it, why did it not work on land? Um, the other cool thing about you know the internet we have on land uh, is that you get, this is from my house, uh, you get many megabytes of data per second. So it's really fast. Um, it can go really far. It, it's really fast. Um, this is the kind of network we are used to. Um, but uh, in the water, there's a problem. Now, this is a graph. I'll try to explain it to you. It basically tells you uh, how much uh, power a, a radio frequency signal loses uh, as it travels underwater. And each curve is a different distance it travels underwater. Um, and if you just look at the black curve, which is 5 meters, only 5 meters underwater, a radio signal um, in at, uh, let's just take a random frequency at, at um, this. A radio signal uh, in five meters loses a bit more than 100 decibels, which is uh, something like 50,000 times of its energy. So it basically reduces drastically in the amount of energy just traveling five meters. Um, point of this graph is to say that any kind of radio communication is more or less impossible underwater. Uh, the radio signals lose power tremendously fast underwater than they lose in air. In air, they can travel for, you know, well, to Jupiter and back, uh, and they still have enough energy for you to detect it. Uh, underwater, uh, just within five meters, there is basically no energy left in that signal that you, like, even our best and the most sensitive detectors won't be able to detect this. So this is, some, this is definitely a lost cause, except in very, very specific cases uh, where extremely low frequency signals are used 
uh, especially in submarines uh, back in the day. Uh, so old military submarines used to use uh, these. But um, there's a lot of problems with those, and that's not consi that's not considered what's top, like the best case uh, research, and, and that's what people are doing today. So um, what other options do we have? Um, there's lasers, uh, because you know why not? Everybody loves lasers. Um, there's a problem with lasers. Uh, this is the kind of water um, you generally see outside the coast of Singapore. Do, is that true? Um, so uh, you, you have dived as well. So um, lasers don't really go very, very well in this. The water is way too murky. So even if you point a laser in this kind of water within a few meters again, uh, you don't detect it anymore. So same problem uh, like electromagnetic waves. Uh, lasers do not work in all waters. If you have a very pristine ocean, you know, in, in off the coast of Thailand or, or somewhere nice. Um, yeah, sure, you might be able to have uh, use lasers, but they don't work in all waters. And the second water gets murky, optical transmission is not a, a use case. Um, so what are the options we have? Um, sound. Hey, uh, dolphins use sound, right? Uh, this is like biomimicry. Uh, so wait, why can't we use sound? Um, that, and, and sound for communication is something that, um, you know, has it been done before? Um, well, uh, do you guys remember this? Hey, this is telephony over, uh, you know, sorry, this is uh, networking over telephony. This is something that uh, we have always done, and this is something that we are very good at doing. We know how to do this. Uh, we have deployed it over for the entire world, and it's, it has worked. This is how our internet used to work back in the day, for those who remember. I, there might be people who might, actually, might not have heard of this before. A anybody hasn't heard of this this sound before? <laughs> All right, cool. All right, I don't have to explain this. Um, if, you, if you go back for a second, this is a cool diagram. If anybody wants to go check it out, somebody did an explanation of what each of the different parts actually has. I'm always used. I always listen to this sound and I know this tone, but this explains what each tone actually does, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you're if you're kind of nerdy, you, it's a n fun website to check out. Um, but it's not so simple. It's um, there's a lot of challenges um, b using sound to communicate underwater, uh, and I'll, I'll go through some of them. Uh, one of the problems we have is bandwidth. You know, I saw I showed you the, uh, the, the 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 meter earlier with my house getting 89 megabits per second upload rate. Um, that's the kind of stuff you get in wireless uh, in uh, wireless networks today. Uh, this is we are nowhere near that in in uh, acoustic networks underwater. Uh, we, we get much, much lesser. This is something I was plotting just a few days ago at work, and uh, it's a model of how much data you can transmit at different frequencies. Um, again, the, the thing to note is at, at something like 200 meters, um, you might get about 100 kbps if you're really lucky. Uh, and this is, again, a theoretical model. So um, you know, practically, you have to discount a little bit of the data for uh, correcting errors and, and doing other kinds of things. Um, but look at something like 500 meters. Um, you can barely get um, you know, 3, 4 kilobits per second. This is the kind of maximum data rate you're looking at. So we're not looking at, at you know, I underwater communications, at least for now, for using Instagram and watching YouTube while you're diving. Uh, although I, I was just talking to some people and they were talking, telling me about how, uh, depending on how deep you go in diving, when you come back, you have to do these um, compulsory rest stops. And they're talking about the, uh, them bringing magazines to read while they're, they're, they're coming up because it's really boring. It uh, takes a lot of time. So you know, they're saying, you know, if this stuff works, you know, YouTube videos would be a great thing to do on, on the way back. <laughs> we're not there yet. Um, maybe someday we will be. But for now, this is the kind of data rate we're looking at. So there's a lot of challenges in, in trying to get this to work. But maybe you know, with some new technology, some new ideas that people are working with, we might be able to uh, figure out. The other big problem in the ocean is noise. Um, the ocean is really, really noisy, especially for acoustic. Uh, many animals use noise. Uh, just basically, ships you know, and the propellers, and you talked about how uh, it's horrible that they end up de uh, destroying or damaging some animals. Uh, they also produce a lot of noise. Um, but trust me, the, the one of the most annoying noises we have in the sea uh, is this shrimp called the snapping shrimp, which around this area uh, of the world, we have a lot of. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what it's doing is it's it's snapping its claw really fast to make a bubble, which then cavitates and causes a shock wave, uh, which then uh, stuns its prey and then it goes and eats the prey. So it's basically using this this bubble 
cavitation mechanism to stun its prey. The problem is, when the bubble cavity, it, it makes this super uh, loud sound. And it sounds uh, something like this. If, if you can play the sound. Uh, it, for the, some people describe it as uh, eggs frying. Uh, it's a very uh, appetizing sound. Um, and, and this is a waveform of how it looks. Um, so for most people, you'll be like, OK, that's just another audio waveform. But uh, for people in communications, they realize this is the worst thing you can ever have for communication because this sound is, is basically affecting every single frequency there is um, in, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your band of frequency you're trying to transmit. So whatever frequency you're trying to transmit at, you know, earlier we saw these graphs and we're like, oh, if you choose this frequency, you might get more data rate. If you choose this, you'll get l less. Well, the snapping shrimp is going to destroy or affect or pu pu put noise in every single frequency there is. Uh, which means it's super annoying to, to, to sort of work with these around. And there's thousands of these in our waters. Uh, and they always snap uh, all the time. So when you go and put anything in the water, it's like the receiver is always going to listen to hear this plus whatever you send, which means it's, it has to somehow figure out how to filter this out. So this is another challenge that people are going through. Snapchat, that's a good idea. Um, the other problem uh, that we don't think about enough is delay. Um, and um, one of the um, things that's sort of very fundamental is physics uh, here. Um, so we use radio for our wireless communications in air. And uh, radio is really fast. Um, it's electromagnetic spectrum, so it travels at 3.3 to the power of, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So very, very fast, very big number. Um, sound is much faster in water than in air. It's about five times faster in uh, water than in air. But it's still not f that fast. So um, if you think about it, um, if you are trying to converse with something that's um, you know, one and a half meters away, uh, one and a half kilometers away, um, sound's going to take one second to go and come back. Now, this is in networking, this is the concept of latency. How long does it take? If I say hi, how long does it, say, uh, how long does it take for you to say hi back? Now, if we are one and a half kilometers away, that's going to be the least it's going to take is two seconds, right? One second to go and one second to come back. That's at least two seconds before I hear a response from you. Now, if you go to a website and you click a button and you don't get a response from it for two seconds, it's really annoying, right? You're like, hey, why does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? So there's an inherent issue with latency. It's something that we don't think about. Uh, if, you have th if there's any gamers here, um, I'm sure you, the gamers here care about latency because when you're playing video games and you try to click on that button to shoot someone or with you know, whatever, Counter-Strike, uh, and you know, you're too slow because your latency is too high and you hit the, the network for being slow, that's exactly what latency is. It's basically the time taken for your signal to go to the other side and their response to come back. And that gets really, really annoying because a lot of our networking uh, protocols and the way we do you know, networking uh, is designed for electromagnetic waves and it's designed to assuming very low latency. And this, that, all that knowledge that we have built up, all that technology that we have built up has to change because now physics has changed. And now if you're using sound in water, we have a lot more delay. Um, so this is what I was talking about. Like if you send something, it takes some time to come back. So this is time going that way. And we have to figure out how to change our networking protocols and the way they work uh, to, to take care of the delay. Because in the time in between, nothing is happening. That's wasted time as well. So you're not only having more latency, but you're also losing the amount of data you could transmit. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of interesting challenges in this part. Uh, it's a very new area. There's a lot of research going on in this area. Um, actually, in fact, um, no, you can go back. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the work that's been done here has been done uh, at a research lab at NUS, uh, which is uh, uh, who we collaborate with a lot. Um, so there's actually an interesting thread throughout a lot of speakers today. There's a lot of NUS connections. Uh, so they have been working a lot with this, and they've been trying to develop a lot of uh, ideas around how to solve these issues and how to make underwater acoustic communication a viable, um, you know, a viable system for. Uh, a bunch of use cases. So that's what we do at Subnero, and I'll, I'll show it, uh, talk about a couple of uh, s things we do to sort of mitigate some of these solutions. Uh, it's, it's basically just writing, just taking all the networking knowledge we have, choosing some of the best bits of it, and um, using it, and then like reinventing a lot of really interesting uh, ground up things. So we write a lot of custom software. 
Um, we, we do a lot of custom networking, so uh, there's all the network stacks and all the, you know, if you've heard of TCP IP, a lot of the basic ideas that, that were b based in those, uh, you have to sort of go back, reobserve them, see if they make sense, otherwise, you know, put in new ones there. So we work on things like that. Um, and we also do a lot of um, custom hardware. So these are some electronics boards that uh, Sean here has built. Uh, so basically, uh, because a lot of the off-the-shelf stuff doesn't work here anymore, we have to build our own, design our own. Um, so what we make, uh, our finally, are, are our modems. So uh, these are this is how they look like. I thought you would like to see how what they seem. They're really big now. Uh, they're not as tiny as uh, you know these guys. Uh, but hopefully, after a few years, uh, we will have um, you know much more better technology and we'll be able to miniaturize them to something that's a lot more smaller. But uh, so if you wanna, if you wanna, you know, Snapchat on in the in the ocean for for now, you have to carry one of these as a diver. Uh, not the best, I would say, but maybe maybe someday. Uh, so some use cases that we, what we are envisioning is uh, is a, is a connected network underwater. So you know, Vignesh's robots and and your coral sensors could all chat with each other, not Snapchat, but just at least communicate each other and and help. Uh, relay the data to so that you know you don't have to go diving all the time. You could just sit in your office and look at what's going on and, and how your the corals are doing or how the robots are doing and change them, um, or, or even uh, you know ships with uh, you know trying to figure out if there's too many fish in the area and you know, try to navigate away from them. Basically, the second you have network underwater, you can do you can do a lot of things that you do on air uh, or on the earth uh, underwater. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, uh, we talked about the open ROV earlier. Hakim showed us his open ROV, which is super cool. Um, one of the things, if you noticed, um, Hakim's one didn't have it, but um, they always come with cables. And um, the idea of remotely operated vehicles is that there's always a cable attached. And cables are really annoying. We talked about this earlier as well. Uh, there's always these tethers. Uh, so this is a new version of the open ROV that's coming up. Uh, Hakim, do you want to build this? <laughs> I'm just curious, but um, it also has a ca ca cable. But imagine um, if you could uh, actually do this without a cable. Uh, if you could communicate it with it wirelessly, tell it where to go, uh, get video data back from it. Uh, that's something that we are working towards, and hopefully one of the days we will be able to do that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you have these big installations, whether it be oil rigs or any kind of big structures in water, uh, maintaining them, uh, you know, looking at them. You know, we we're talking about biofouling earlier. Cleaning them is, is a quite a big hassle. Having sensors to know whether, you know, if they are broken, if there's, f there's fouling, if you need to go um, clean them is something that's super useful. And uh, one of, uh, again, if these sensors could, you know, s communicate wirelessly without needing cables, that would be super handy as well. So these are the kind of use cases we are looking at. Um, and that's all I had to share about. This is how we try to sh communicate underwater. We are still a, a young startup. We're trying to figure out what we can do. Um, so if you have any ideas, queries, questions, you can come meet me or Sean later and we can talk about, you know, networks, communications and underwater stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much.